we'll go ahead and uh, kind of kick this off here. And, and as we do, I want to share just a couple of passages um, of Scripture with you. The first one is um, uh, Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Uh, every political ideology, plan, scheme, uh, whatever it may be, is all going to perish one day. It's all going to pass away. And so we of all people on the face of the earth ought to have the long view in sight. Uh, certainly be aware of the short view, but be aware of the long view too. Be aware that, that this is just temporary. Also, uh, Psalm 118, uh, uh, 8. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. And then verse 9, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather trust in the Lord than to trust in any uh, political party, any political leader, any political ideology. It doesn't matter what it is. Trust in the Lord. And remember that as, as uh, Jesus told Peter in Matthew chapter 16, uh, he said, Jesus said, uh, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so we understand from that that Jesus has given authority to the church in, in this world. That's a powerful thing. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against the advance of the church. Cannot do so. And, and nothing that happens, no matter, uh, I mean, just consider, since the church was founded by Jesus Christ on the confession of Peter there in Matthew 16, how many political leaders have tried to stamp out the church? Lots. How many have been successful? Zero. They are batting exactly zero against the church. No matter how hard they have tried, no matter how hard they have sought to put it uh, somewhere else, they have not been able to do so. It has been impossible. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, you are taking something that is temporal and putting it up against something that is eternal. The eternal is going to win every time. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be seeming advances by the temporal, but it does mean that they will not be permanent and they will not be utterly successful. So, let's go ahead with that in mind, start thinking about the national election outlook. Now, last week we got into this. We talked about how uh, in Michigan we have some national offices that are up for election, not the presidency. This is a midterm election. So the presidency is not up for uh, a vote until 2024. But our representatives are and our senators are not. No U.S. senator from Michigan is up for re-election this year. So it's only the representatives. But we talked about how last week the U.S. Senate is still important and how the Senate is broken down is important because of things like the filibuster, things like uh, judicial and executive appointments, and things like that. But tonight I want us to think about the U.S. House of Representatives because every member of the U.S. House is up for re-election. In fact, every member of the U.S. House is up for re-election every two years. A representative's term is only two years long, and a senator's term is six years long. And as we saw last week, a third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years. So there's a kind of a, a small turnover 
in that body every two years, but in the house, it could be huge. It could be. Here's the problem. Every, if you ask anybody in the U.S. what their opinion of Congress is as a whole, <laughs> if you've seen those polls, uh, used car salesmen rank higher in trust than Congress. And I remember Mark Twain once said that the most dangerous time is when the Congress is in session. Uh, it, it's absolutely a, uh, a real outlook there. But if you ask that same person who distrusts Congress what they think of their local representative, they will all say, oh, he or she is doing a great job. And that's across the board. So if everybody in the U.S. thinks their representative's doing a great job, but everybody thinks Congress is horrible, we have a conflicting idea that we're all holding in our head at the same time. And, and that's just a unique aspect of the American political system that I've always found very, very interesting. Um, but when it comes to the U.S. House, uh, this, is, this is important because the House was meant to be the branch of government that was closest to the people according to how the founders created the nation. You have to understand, they, they, they set the president and the vice president to be elected by something called the Electoral College, right? Who votes in the Electoral College, you and me? No, electors. Who elects the people of the Electoral College? You and me? Not really. Uh, you see, we've insulated that from a lot. Now, most states award their electors to whoever gets the most of the popular vote within that state. Not every state does. Nebraska and Maine do it different. We'll not get into that. That's getting into the weeds a little bit. But um, the point is that it's, it's insulated. And the national vote for president doesn't elect the president. That's not the way we do things. The Senate, as it was originally designed by the founders, was not elected by you and me. It was selected by the state legislatures because the Senate was supposed to represent the states. That's why every state has two senators, no matter the size. They were to have equal representation of the states in the Senate. Now, we changed that in the early 1900s when we amended the Constitution and allowed senators to be elected by popular vote within the state. So now we have two houses that are closely tied to the people. It wasn't meant to be that way, but that's the way it is now. But the House was always meant to be the closest to the people because we elect them directly, and it's the smallest district, right? Representatives only cover a small district. Now, in Michigan, who knows what U.S. representative district they live in? Yeah, the number. A couple of you. You're in three? I don't know. Uh, most of us here are either in four or five. So it depends on which one. Okay, so they've changed it. Uh, you're right, they did with the reapportionment. Yeah, they because in the census of 2020, Michigan lost a representative. The population of the state went down, and so it lost a representative, which meant they had to redraw all the U.S. districts. So whose district are you in? Well, for like I say, most of us, it's either District 4 and your representative Currently, the incumbent is a man named Bill Huizinga, or Huizinga, uh, uh, Huizinga. Uh, that's, what's that? Huizinga, okay. Uh, I've seen that and I've heard it pronounced a lot of different ways. So Huizinga, okay, so that's District 4. That's kind of the north side of this area and over to the west. Um, south and stretching almost across the whole bottom part of Michigan from uh, Monroe County in southeast Michigan all the way across, 
it's District 5, and that is represented by the incumbent Tim Wahlberg. And uh, those are the two incumbents. Both are Republicans, and there are uh, each one of them are facing three opponents in the general election. They're obviously play, uh, facing somebody from the Democratic Party. Then they're also facing a candidate from the Libertarian Party and a candidate from the U.S. Taxpayers Party. So two third-party candidates. Uh, libertarians are the most well-known, but U.S. Taxpayer uh, is not far behind that. But let's, let's talk about why the U.S. House matters as a whole. First of all, according to the U.S. Constitution, all tax bills must originate in the House. And that was on purpose. It's because the House was to be the House, the chamber closest to the people. And if you're going to get taxed, you want your direct representative to be the one responsible for it, or at least where it begins. And that's why that provision in Article 1, Section 7 of the U.S. Constitution is there. Um, so, in other words, if we're going to create a new tax, the Senate can't do it. It can't start there. It has to be passed there eventually, but it has to start in the House. Uh, so, new tax bills, that's an important aspect of this. But a second reason is because the House's way of running itself is very different from the Senate. The House controls, the, whoever the majority party is in the House controls the legislative process in that chamber. Which means if the Republican Party has control, the Speaker of the House controls what gets brought forward. They have complete control over what bills even get out of committee uh, and are voted on by the whole House. In addition, the House has a special committee called the Rules Committee. And the Rules Committee actually sets how that bill will be debated, how long they'll debate it, how long each side has to debate it, how many amendments each side can offer to it, all of that. Uh, and in the House, all amendments have to be germane to the bill, which means that the amendments have to have something to do with the legislation. In the Senate, they do not. So I can have a defense bill in the Senate and I can add an amendment to it for agriculture in my local area. It has nothing to do with defense. But in the House, that's not true. And so it has to be germane to the legislation. But the party in control has absolute authority to decide everything. They can say Republican side will have three amendments, the Democratic side will have two amendments. Democrats could get really mad about that but they don't have any way to stop it because the rules committee will vote on it and put it in place. Now, typically they give it equal amendments and equal time to debate because they know if they lose control of the chamber next time, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? And they don't want that to necessarily happen to them, all right? But again, just like in the Senate, who controls the House matters, especially because there have been discussions of codifying Roe v. Wade into U.S. law. Um, and we'll talk about this a, a little bit more when we get to Proposal 3 tonight. But if this is passed at the federal level, then it is going to apply to every state. And that's something we need to be aware of and why this, this matters greatly. Judy, hold on just a minute. Uh, Jeremy is playing Andy tonight, so he's got the microphone and is going to bring that around to you. Okay, for codifying Roe, can the president sign an executive order doing that? No. The president cannot sign it. That's a great question, and, and somebody asked something like that last week, too. Um, the president cannot sign an executive order making Roe v. Wade the law of the land because executive orders cannot be used to create laws. Executive orders can only be used to clarify how the executive branch will enforce a law. Okay, remember, this is the whole separation of powers idea in U.S. government. The legislative branch makes the laws, the executive branch executes the laws. 
carries them out. And so an executive order is supposed to be to say, okay, here's what the law is. And, and this is a little bit of uh, behind the scenes, but, but typically Congress will pass laws that are relatively vague in the enforcement. And they do so on purpose. Because if they get too specific, it opens it up to uh, being challenged in court but it also creates problems. So what they do is they leave it open and then the executive comes in with an executive order and says, well, I know it says this in big broad terms, but I'm gonna narrow it down and this is how I'm directing the, brand, uh, the, the bureaucracy who is under me to enforce it. Now, has there been abuse of executive orders? Yes, uh, by both parties. Both parties have abused the executive order process. Started here, and then each side just tit for tat uh, have, have done that, unfortunately. But nobody has actually, uh, I mean, there has been, it, they've pushed the limit on whether or not they've actually tried to create legislation with executive orders. Um, but the courts have kind of given a lot of leeway to the executive branch to use those. All right, so good question, though, good question. All right, let's talk about Michigan now. Let's get into our local election. We've seen how the national election is important, how the control of those two chambers of Congress are very important, but let's start getting a little closer to home and look at our, our statewide election. All of the statewide offices in Michigan are up for re-election this year, which means the governor and the lieutenant governor, in Michigan they run together. They run as a ticket, kind of like the president and vice president. Not every state does that. Some states elect the governor and the lieutenant governor separate from one another. And yes, that can create a problem. And yes, it has created problems in some states over the years. But we link them together, we elect them together. We also have the attorney general and the secretary of state. Those are statewide offices. Everybody in Michigan from Iron Mountain to uh, Monroe are going to elect these individuals, okay? And right now, all three of these offices are controlled um, by or, or are held by Democrats, okay? So you have um, Governor Whitmer, uh, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, I believe, uh, Attorney General Nessel and Secretary of State Benson. So you have all Democrats in those offices. Now that was a change two year, or four years ago. They were all Republicans and had been for a long time. Uh, now it's all Democrats. We'll see what happens in this election. It's very close. Those leads that were much bigger earlier a couple of months ago have shrunk for the incumbents. So, uh, but these are important. And if you don't think they're important, just think back two years. You don't have to go very far to see how important these things are. Okay, so these are all up for uh, election. Now, we also have the state House and Senate races. In Michigan, the state House of Representatives are all elected every two years. The Senate, every four years. Not six. The U.S. Senate is six-year terms, but the state Senate is a four-year term. Now, um, you know, as, as we talked about already, there's uh, your state. I did not put state House or state Senate districts in here for you because we have folks who live in a, in a vast, a wide variety of places, and these districts are much smaller. And so there would be a lot of representatives and senators Represented, represented in here um, by you. So, so certainly take a look at your ballot and, and in just a moment, I'm gonna give you some information uh, for that as well. But we also have uh, state boards that are elected. Yes. Yes, uh, they do have term limits uh, in, the Mich in the Michigan House and Senate. And I'm gonna talk about that when we get to proposal one, yes. So uh, I did not 
mention that on purpose. So, but thank you for bringing that up. All right, we also have some state boards. So for instance, we have like the State Board of Education is elected statewide, and that's, there are positions open for that. That's important. Not every position on the State Board of Education comes up in every election, they rotate. And so some are up for election, some have a longer term, they're staggered. Uh, also the same with the constitutionally required university trustees. How many of the state universities are elected statewide, their trustees? Three, three, Michigan, Michigan State, and Wayne State. And to make things more confusing, we don't call them all the same thing, even though they all do the same thing, they have the same position. The University of Michigan are called regents, the University or Michigan State are called trustees, and Wayne State are called governors. I can't tell you why. I would, I, there's, there's a reason, I'm sure, but I don't have it. Yes and no. All of the state schools are governed by essentially trustees, no matter what they're called, regents, trustees, governors, but only three are elected statewide. The University of Michigan, Michigan State, and Wayne State. So Northern Michigan, Western Michigan, Eastern Michigan, Central Michigan, they have trustees, but they are not elected statewide. Uh, no, some of them are appointed by governors. Yeah. And they're on staggered terms too, so a governor won't necessarily put everybody on a board. And the president of the college reports. Yes. The president of the university would report to the trustees. Yep, absolutely. Um, so that's an interesting thing to p pay attention to, but I do know like um, community colleges, their boards are elected locally. So for Kalamazoo or for Kellogg Community College, if you're within that area, you will get to vote for the trustees of Kellogg Community College. But somebody in Jackson would not. They'd be voting for Jackson Community College's uh, uh, trustees. It gets interesting, doesn't it? You start getting into this and you, you start to see why these things are are on, the, uh, on your ballot in different ways. And then we also have judicial elections. In Michigan, we elect judges. We elect judges. We don't elect judges at, this, at the federal level. Uh, federal judges are appointed. And once they're appointed, how long does a federal judge serve? on good behavior. That is the words in the US Constitution. They serve for life on good behavior. So they, they serve as long as they want unless they are impeached by the US House and convicted by the US Senate. They would go through an impeachment trial just like a president would. Uh, all federal judges are in that position. Um, and there have been judges and justices of the Supreme Court who have been successfully impeached and convicted and removed from office. It has happened. Um, we have not had that happen with the president, but we have had it happen with judges. So now you'll notice I put a question mark up there. Nonpartisan judicial elections. Are they really nonpartisan? No, that's very quick and very right. Uh, no, judges are not nonpartisan. Judges have ideologies just like you and I have an ideology. The difference is they don't tell you. They're not upfront about it because we don't want them to be. We want them to be nonpartisan. We want them to be fair and even-handed and not bringing that into the courtroom. We love to lie to ourselves about that and say that that's the way it is. It isn't, but it also has never been that way. 
you see this is a holdover from a long time ago when when it was believed that the judicial branch was to rise above politics and and never was that true even if you go back to the very beginning of the supreme court uh, there's a very famous case that the supreme court decided very early in the history of our nation called Marbury versus Madison. Um, this was at a time when uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson had just been elected. So we're talking 1800. Jefferson had just been elected. James Madison was his vice president. John Adams, who was the lame duck president, made what were called midnight appointments Right before he left office, he appointed a whole bunch of political or people to political offices, like postmasters and everything. Well, not all of those appointments were delivered in time before Jefferson became president. Remember, this was a time before email, so long before instantaneous communication. So some of them didn't get delivered. Well, one of them, a man by the name of Marbury, was supposed to be appointed to a political office. And Jefferson said, no, you're a federalist. I'm not a federalist. I don't want you in office. I'm going to put my own person there. So Marbury sued. And Jefferson was thrilled because he did not like the federalist system. He was very little d democratic. And so he was just waiting for Chief Justice John Marshall to make a decision so that he could ignore it and show just how powerless the Supreme Court was. So Chief Justice John Marshall was in a predicament. And he, he decided this case in probably what was the most brilliant way possible. He decided in favor of Marbury, but then said it's unenforceable. We can't do anything about it. So Jefferson, who read it, was like, I want to ignore this, but I can't. There's nothing I can do because there's no enforcement. He's not enforcing, he ruled against me, but he's not enforcing it, so I can't not enforce a not being enforced thing. And so as a result, Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall, established what was no, became known as judicial review. He said the Supreme Court has the authority to review laws and to declare whether they are constitutional or not constitutional. It was, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, but, but that's at the, national, at the state level. We have all of these judicial positions, and they don't have an R or a D or an L or anything beside their name. The only thing they might have beside their name is an I. And what does I mean? Not independent. What's that? Incumbent. They are an incumbent. That means that they are currently in that position at the time of the election. That's the only thing we can tell. And honestly, a lot of people who go into the polling place will simply vote for the person that has an I beside their name because, well, they're there. I'll go with the devil I know rather than the devil I don't. Uh, that tends to be the case. That's our shorthand, our shortcut for trying to figure this out. So what can we do? How can we figure this out? Scott, I know you asked this question. How can we know who these people are? Well, there's a few different ways. One is, today we have Google. Type their name into Google and look them up. You'll see plenty of information there but make sure that you go to a reputable source please don't go to bob's guide on judges uh I, I don't know who bob is and i don't know if he is an expert on judges but i just go to a reputable source another thing that you can do is on this little page here that says helpful links and resources I've included several organizations. Some of them are going to be more about information at the broad level, uh, things like Alliance Defending Freedom, the Liberty Council, groups like that. But 
Further down that list, you'll see the I Voter Guide and My Faith Votes and Ballotpedia. You can go on to any of those sites and you can pull up and look up these individuals and you can get some pretty factual information about those people. You can also see who endorses them because remember it's a nonpartisan election. However, that doesn't mean that the parties don't endorse judicial candidates in Michigan. They absolutely do. The Republican Party endorses candidates. The Democratic Party endorses candidates. So just be aware of that. Um, are we allowed to look that up in the booth or do we have to? You are not allowed to look that up in the booth, probably. Uh, I'm not saying that some people, but, but you're not supposed to take in, I know we have a couple of poll workers here. Um, I don't think you're supposed to be able to take your phone and stuff like that into the polling booth and be looking stuff up on it. Yes. Yes, you can take a list in with you, like a piece of paper that you've checked off who you want to vote for so that you can make those marks on your ballot. But you can't take your iPad in and start typing and looking stuff up in the ballot. They, they're not. They're going to frown upon that. So, so you definitely don't want to do that. Uh, hold on, Shelby, and then Judy here. For the state supreme court, they are nominated by the parties, but they don't have any record on the ballot of which yes. party nominated them. That is true. Yes, they are nominated the by the party. They're just independent. So yes. To speak. Yes, the local ones, the probate judges, the magistrates, all that kind of stuff. Yes, Judy. Yes, but that does not apply to the nonpartisan uh, uh, offices. You still have to vote for the judges independent of that straight party ticket because they are not on a party line. So, yes, your straight party vote would only apply to governor and lieutenant governor together, secretary of state, um, uh, the attorney general, your local representative or any representatives or senators who are on the ballot for your area and then those other boards that and local elections but those nonpartisan ones and also the proposals would not be included in that straight party ticket so if you vote that way you have to go in and independently mark each judicial and nonpartisan uh, position too all right so yes Scott. So I got a question with this one. So say the uh, the situation is the incumbent is endorsed by the Democratic Party. The uh, challengers you looked up did did your uh, due diligence to look them up and find out that they uh, say they were a proponent for Planned Parenthood, and those are the only two. Would that be a good point for abstaining from voting at that point in time? Would that would, or would should we in a good citizen? That is, uh, as I said before, I don't tell people who to vote for. But I do say it's a matter of conscience. And just like we said last week when we talked about those, should a Christian vote, right? Um, generally, I would say yes. In our system of government, it is a right that has been afforded to us by uh, people who have fought and died to protect that right. Um, I think we should. I think scripturally we can make that point that we should. But there might be instances where none of the candidates on that position are people whom we could vote for in good conscience. If your conscience cannot allow you to vote for somebody in that situation, then yes, I think you should abstain and not violate your conscience. But I think typically you're not going to find that too. That's going to be rare in, in our system right now. Uh, and I can tell you right now that if you look at the judicial candidates, you're not going to run into that position. Um, so that's, that's absolutely uh, where we're at. Okay, so the last one, local elections. Your township, 
or village or city or whatever the case may be, you're going to have a whole lot of things in here. You're going to have village council or village president or what, yeah, and in Takancha, it's the village president who happens to be my father-in-law. Uh, so um, I, I vote for him every time, right? He's also the only one on there. Uh, so um, he, he's running unopposed. So th- that's, that's on there, right? And this is, this is one of the hardest areas to get info on because if you go on to these, like, I voter guide and my faith, faith votes, if, if you're living in Detroit, you're going to have plenty of information. If you're living in Tecancha, you're going to have no information on these guides. Because I can assure you, nobody has looked up what my father-in-law believes on anything. They just haven't. <laughs> so where do you, that's exactly right. Where do you get the information in that case? From, from your neighbors, honestly. And, and, and being involved in your community. Oh, sure, yeah, you're going to have people that go door to door that, that, you know, invite them in for coffee. I know that's scary, Ooh. but do it, right? They're, they're probably not serial killers, um, but invite them in and, and have coffee and ask them the questions. Say, okay, you want my vote? Well, you're going to have to earn it, right? You, you need to f- find out what that's going on, uh, what, they, what they are believing, what they're going to support, what they're going to do. Um, but this is where, you know, you want to ask your friends, your neighbors, talk to them at the coffee shop, as Jason said, go down and have those conversations, um, and ask them directly. Now in Takancha, I can go and, and for anyone on the ballot in Takancha, I can go to their house and ask them what it is that, you know, if I'm that concerned, but I already know all of them and I know who I'm going to vote for and who I'm not going to vote for. It becomes a little more difficult saying Battle Creek. It's a little bit bigger than Tecancha, slightly. Uh, but, you know, you, you do need to do a little bit more due diligence in that. And as a last resort, you do have the heuristic, the shortcut of party identification. So you know which party you lean towards or that you identify with and so if you come down to a place where you don't know who it is, then you look to see who it is that's running from your party. That's what we do. Um, it's, it's a way that we, we balance the cost of getting information about every single race and trying to process it and think it through. Sometimes we just don't have time to do all that. And we need to figure it out, so we use party identification. All right, any questions on the elections in terms of that? Again, I don't tell anybody who to vote for. Uh, That is between you and the Lord. Um, But in a moment, I am going to give you some suggestions on proposals because policies, I can say that about, and I I will share with you at least my opinion, and you can take it or leave it. But Shelby's got a question here, so Jeremy, you get to move a little bit more, get those steps in. A comment more than a question. If they say you vote for three and you only know two of them, there's nothing wrong with voting for just two. And oh, sure. And voting for the third or voting for just one. Yes. Um, and sometimes, when I, if I can remember back when I was in high school, we had a person running from our neighborhood for the city council, and you could vote for three, and everybody in our neighborhood voted for all three. Another person that actually won by three or four votes over our neighbor, they, his neighborhood just voted for him only. Mm-hmm. And they started looking, and a lot of our people, because the other guy was a good guy, and so they voted him as one of their choices. Yep. Um, so there's more than just picking a good guy. There's politics involved in scheming. Always is, but yes. All right, so let's now turn to the proposals that are going to be on your ballot here in Michigan, everybody's ballot. There's three this year. There are three proposed amendments to the Constitution, and the first one has to do with term limits. It will be marked Proposal 22-1, 
on your ballot. And I'm actually going to show you the language uh, of that. I've got it up here, and I'm going to do this with each one. It says, it require members of the legislature, governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, and attorney general file annual public financial disclosure reports after 2023, including assets, liabilities, income sources, future employment agreements, gifts, travel reimbursements, and positions held in organizations except religious, social, and political organizations. Uh, that sounds really confusing, doesn't it? It's like, well, we want to know what you're... Uh, part of unless it's a religious, social, or political group. I don't know what other groups there are, but uh, apparently whatever they are, tell us what you're in. Here's the thing about that. The legislature already has to do this every year. Who does not have to do this is the governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, and attorney general. They do not have to file any financial disclosures but the legislature does. So this just puts it across the board in that respect. Second, it requires the legislature implement but not limit or restrict these reporting requirements. And then this is the big part of this one. Replace current term limits for state representatives and state senators with a 12-year total limit in any combination between House and Senate, except a person elected to the Senate in 2022 may be elected the number of times allowed when that person became a candidate. Okay, so it's just saying for the Senate this year, it's going to be under the current rules, but anybody else, it's gonna be under this new rule. Okay, so let's talk about that. We already talked about this part. It requires the annual declaration of financial reports uh, executive officials have not had to do that up to this point. This would require them to do it. But the bigger reason why this is ter uh, labeled the term limits proposal is because of that last point. Currently in the state of Michigan, a person can serve three two-year terms in the House and two four-year terms in the Senate. So that's six and eight for a total of 14 years. The proposed change is 12 years in any combination. So what this would do is it could tell somebody, if you want to do six terms in the House, you can do that. Or if you want to do three terms in the Senate, you can do that. Just focus on one or the other. Now, I will tell you that a lot of people will argue against term limits by saying that they cause people to not know what they're doing in the legislature, that it takes time to learn the process and become an expert to be able to get anything done. And by the time you learn it, your term's up and you have to leave. And that doesn't, that actually creates more special interest influence in the legislature because these representatives and senators need some kind of information. They don't know how to get it themselves. They don't have the experience. So they turn to the interest groups who are all too ready and all too happy to provide them all the information they need to vote. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. But I can say pretty confidently that when our founders established the nation, they did not expect people to become career politicians. They saw the citizen politician, the farmer representative, the farmer senator, the person who actually is working and gives up a few years of his life or her life to go and serve and then to come back after a few years. I did my service, I'm back to being a productive citizen. And what we have had, and it started actually very early in the history of our nation, people who got into power and realized, hey, this is pretty cool. I like having power. I like having prestige. I like people calling me senator. And wow, I can get the best table at the restaurant. I couldn't get this before. And they decided to stay. And of course, there were no term limits, and nationally, there still are no term limits. It would require a constitutional amendment, just like we did with the presidency, to limit the number of terms a person could serve in Congress. So, and guess what? Congress isn't proposing that themselves. Uh, but in our state, we do, um, we do have this. Now, this ballot, this was actually put on the ballot by 
the state legislature. This is the only one that was put forward by the state legislature and not by the people. It's endorsed by the legislature, which is controlled by the Republican Party and by the governor. Uh, so this has bipartisan support. Sometimes I get worried about that. I'm just going to, I'm not going to lie to you. If everybody's behind it, I start getting a little concerned. Uh, so this, this means everybody's getting rich off of this, and I don't know if I like that. Um, I think that one of the challenges to this is that it could actually create more career politicians than less. Yes, the amount of time is shorter, 12 years versus 14, but it's all in one chamber. And the amount of power that comes with that is, is immense. Uh, now, it also would allow that past term-limited politicians can now run again because it's new rules. And so somebody who's already been term-limited out, now we have a whole new set of rules. They've already served their 14 years. They can come back and serve another 12 for a total of 26. Uh, this would change that. Uh, so this is a, this is kind of iffy. Uh, Max has got his hand up back here, Jeremy. Real quick, they wouldn't have to be required to have a, a step out for a couple of years before they could do that? No, because they've already been out. And this is a new set of laws, a new set of rules. So they're not, they're not under that. Uh, those who are in office right now, um, the only one that it would apply to, if you go back and look at the, the language, it just says, except a person elected to the Senate in this year may be elected to the number of times allowed when that person became a candidate. That's the only exception. Everybody else would be under the new set. That's your little scapegoat. Yeah, yeah. So m my recommendation, and this is not me endorsing anything, this is just me telling you where I stand. Uh, I'm voting no on this. Uh, I think it's, it's not a good idea. I think our current term limit law is a good one. And I'm one of those people who don't fix what ain't broke. Uh, it works. Let's keep it the way that it is and not create more problems. Okay. Any questions on that besides what we've covered already? I'm trying to move through these a little quick because I really want to get to Prop 3. Okay, so let's look at Prop 2. Uh, this one's important too, uh, and it's election provisions. And this one is also sneaky, so we have to pay attention here. This is what you're going to see on your ballot. It recognizes a fundamental right to vote without harassing conduct. Now, that sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, hey, who's against that? Require military or overseas ballots be counted if postmarked by election day. Absolutely, we should count the ballots of our military if they're overseas. Provide voter right to verify identity with photo ID, photo ID or a signed statement. Oh, well, no, wait a minute. Okay, well, just... Put that in your pocket. We'll hold on to that. Provide a voter right to single application to vote an absentee in all elections. Oh, that's interesting, too. Require state-funded absentee ballot drop boxes and postage for absentee applications and ballots. All right, now we've got expenditures involved. Provide that only election officials may conduct post-election audits. Require nine days of early in-person voting. We do not currently have that in Michigan. Some states do, uh, but we do not. That's interesting as well. Allow donations to fund elections, which must be disclosed. Wait, what? Okay, we'll talk about that in a moment. Require canvas boards certify election results based only on the official records of votes cast. This is an excellent example of you don't get to pick and choose. Are there good provisions in this proposal? Yes, I think there are some. And there's some really bad ones in here too. But you don't get to get just the good ones. You have to take everything. 
And so let's talk about that. First of all, this would eliminate the hard requirement of a state-issued ID. Michigan passed a law that requires a state-issued ID to vote. And they said, okay, if you can't afford a state-issued ID, we will give you a free ID. It's not a driver's license, but it is a state-issued and state-verified ID. So you can vote. So they're trying to reduce the cost of voting. Uh, and I'm not talking about just the monetary cost, but the cost in terms of having an ID, the time, excuse me, all of that. This would get rid of it. And it would require, in lieu, if you show up, I have to show my ID every time I go to vote. And they take it, they look at it, they compare it, they move it down the line, I move down the little line, I get all my stuff, I'm, I move on. This would just simply say, if you don't have an ID, and somebody walked into the Tecancha precinct and said, hi, I'm David Henry. Well, they might say, oh, okay, I don't know who David Henry is, uh, uh, but can I see some ID? Oh, no, I left it at home. Okay, well, just sign this piece of paper that says you're David Henry. Okay, I can do that. Uh, and they sign David Henry, they move down, they get my ballot, and they vote. Later on in the day, I come in with my ID, and I say, I'm David Henry. Uh, and by the way, I am David Henry. Uh, and they say, oh, you've already voted. Nope, I didn't. Well, we've got this paper here with your signature. Not my signature. Well, too bad. You voted. Uh, this is all it takes, right? Um, that's dangerous. That is really dangerous. It also requires nine days of early voting in addition to the one day of voting on the, the second Tuesday, you know, all that kind of stuff, okay? It has to be fully staffed by election officials, and it has to be the full length of time as the regular voting day. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this. Shelby and you guys volunteer. How hard is it to get election volunteers for all the precincts? They, they struggle to get them all covered for one day. Now make it 10. It isn't going to happen, right? But there's going to be a cost associated with this. There's going to be a huge cost. Another thing that's in this provision, it would automatically send absentee ballots to a voter every year if they request one for a single year. Remember I said one application for an absentee ballot? That now means you get sent an absentee ballot every single year. Whether you intend to vote in person or not, it's just going to keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. This is a potential issue, right? And again, it would require the state to provide postage paid envelopes for absentee ballots. That's going to get expensive. Yes, Deb. Yes. And Joe Blow can sign your ballot. Right, because all it takes is your signature now. It doesn't require anything else. There you go. That's exactly right. Uh, those ballots can come to your address whether you live there or not. Could. It, it opens it up to the possibility. Not saying it will, but it does open it up to the possibility. Just Mm -hmm. And then I would take it over to her. And uh, the ballot never arrived. And so I went back down um, the other day to City Hall. And I told him, I don't know why you're making this hard on me. I filled out with mom all this paperwork this summer. And they checked and they claimed that her ballot was mailed. And they said to, they're blaming the post office for not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now I've got it tracked down with the post office. So, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. It's absolutely a challenge. Yep. So not always the easiest thing. All right, last thing, uh, well, not the last, but here, uh, this allows third parties, interest groups, individuals, whatever, to finance elections. Who in the world thought that was a good idea? I don't know about you, I don't want Facebook 
financing the election. I don't want Twitter or Apple or anybody else financing the election, whether you disclose it or not. Bad idea. But it could also be allowed, this is an interesting one, it could be allowed to allow uh, incarcerated individuals and those who are deemed mentally incompetent the right to vote. This does not stop that. In fact, it would remove all the provisions from that because it would, that first thing about removing harassment, everybody has the right to vote and cannot be harassed or kept from it. That includes people who are incarcerated and people who are deemed mentally incompetent, who are not allowed to vote currently. Um, and, and those who, listen, this is, this is a dangerous, dangerous proposal. Again, there are some good things in there. It says some good things, but on the whole, it is bad. And so again, I'm voting no on this one as well but I, I, I can't support that one. The last one, reproductive rights. And again, I, I could not put that without putting quotes around it. Um, let's take a look at that. Establish a new individual right to reproductive freedom, including the right to make and carry out all decisions about pregnancy, such as prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraceptive, sterilization, Abortion, miscarriage management, and infertility. That's an individual right. Allow state to regulate abortion after fetal viability, but not prohibit if medically needed to protect a patient's life or physical or mental health. So it essentially gives with one hand and takes away with the other. Forbid state discrimination in enforcement of this right. Prohibit prosecution of an individual or a person helping a pregnant individual for exercising rights established by this amendment and invalidate state laws conflicting with this amendment. At this point, I'm going to refer you to this handout. If you've got it, take a look at it because there is so much in this that I, I didn't want to put it all up here. Um, this is what the actual Article 1, Section 28, Rights to Reproductive Freedom is going to say. It says, each individual has a fundamental right to reproductive freedom, which entails the right to make and effectuate decisions about all matters relating to pregnancy, including but not limited to prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraceptive sterilization, abortion care, miscarriage management, and infertility care. An individual's right to reproductive freedom shall not be denied, burdened, nor infringed upon unless justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. Notwithstanding the above, the state may regulate the provision of abortion care after fetal viability, provided that in no circumstance shall the state prohibit an abortion that, in the professional judgment of an attending health care professional, is medically indicated to protect the life or physical or mental health of the pregnant individual. As you can see, there are six things to pay attention to there. First of all, each individual, that does not limit it to adults. That is minors as well. And that means that all of these things, including something like sterilization, can take place in a minor without any outside knowledge. That means that a 15-year-old can go in for this without a parent ever knowing, ever being notified, ever having anything to be aware of in this. Um, and again, don't forget, this is a constitutional amendment. This is not just a law. This changes the Michigan State Constitution, the fundamental law of our state. Uh, that is huge. Um, the, the right would be nearly impossible. It says that it shall not be denied, burdened, nor infringed upon unless a compelling state interest achieved the least restrictive means. They're, they can't do it, right? Because it says you can't restrict it if an attending health professional. Notice what that says, a health professional. Guess what that isn't? Only a doctor. There are other healthcare professionals. Do you know who is a healthcare professional? A chiropractor. 
they are considered under state law a health care professional. I'm pretty sure a chiropractor ought to have no influence over this question, and yet under this law, as it is written, they could. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the clinics, anything like that, yeah. Uh, as you can see, under Michigan law, number five on the left-hand side, dentist acupuncturists, an acupuncturist is a health professional, a massage therapist, a massage therapist, counselors and more, they are given the ability to approve a late-term abortion. This takes place at any time over the entire gestation period from the moment of fertilization until the moment of birth. Do you understand what that means? That means the day before a lady gives birth, that baby could be aborted because the mental health of the pregnant individual may be jeopardized. And what is mental health? I can tell you that under this law, that could include concern over finances. How am I going to pay for this baby? Can I ask any parent in here, because I have two kids in here tonight, I have a third running around, I had no idea how I was going to pay for one. When I came home, when Erin said, come home, I was in the office at Western, and she called me when she got her pregnancy test, and she said, you need to come home, I need to, I've got some news I need to share with you. I had no idea what was going on. And I came home and tied to the door of our little apartment was a baby bib. And that baby bib said, IRS deduction. <laughs> that is a true story. And, but, but listen, it was a concern. It was absolutely a concern. And I don't care who you are. You wonder how you're going to pay for a kid and so, yes, guess what? That's one of the reasons why you can uh, uh, hold your questions, if you will. I want to get through this, and then we'll, we'll have that at the end, okay? Uh, the state shall not discriminate in the protection or enforcement of this fundamental right. The state shall not penalize, prosecute, or otherwise take an adverse action against an individual based on their actual potential perceived or alleged pregnancy outcomes, including but not limited to miscarriage, stillbirth, or abortion, nor shall the state penalize, prosecute, or otherwise take adverse action against someone for aiding or assisting a pregnant individual in exercising their right to reproductive freedom with their voluntary consent. In other words, if, if you help somebody abort their baby and something and you don't have any because you're an acupuncturist and you don't have any idea how to do this you're not legally responsible for what happens and for the purpose of this section a state interest is compelling only if it is for the limited purpose of protecting the health of an individual seeking care not for the baby consistent with accepted clinical standards of practice and evidence-based medicine and does not infringe on that individual's autonomous decision-making. And then it defines fetal viability, the point in a pregnancy when the professional judgment of an attending healthcare professional and based on the particular facts of the case, there is a significant likelihood of the fetus's sustained survival outside the uterus without the application of extraordinary medical measures. No baby exists outside being born, even a healthy full-term baby, without some stuff happening to it afterwards. Okay, so this is just, just crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And we want to enshrine this as a fundamental right. In other words, a right that you have apart from any government. You have the right to do this. I don't think I need to tell you where I'm voting on this one. I think you probably have a pretty good idea. But this is a, I mean, it's as, it's as if as you're moving down the proposals, it is bad, worse, worst. Um, I've not seen anything quite like this in, in all my years of, of studying this kind of stuff and of voting. I've never seen anything 
like this. It's, it's absolutely crazy. Isaac, I know you had a question a moment ago. Uh, so real quick, um, uh, what you got? Well, the whole thing seems to be convoluted, but I see ways that this could be twisted. You've got a 15-year-old who accidentally, you know how it happens, and their parents, well, I'm a legal guardian. I'm taking responsibility. I'm forcing the child to have an abortion because you are now in the, the I forget the legal term for it, but you're, you're the uh, person of, the, uh, of importance to a, of a child, and the, the, the law says since I can step in, I can force the child as I read that. Not only can they take the child who's now mentally uh, unstable because of the situation, and regardless of what the parents want, um, yeah, I, I, it says again about on, on, um, on sterilization. As I read this, if you're the parent and the legal guardian of a child, you can take and have that child sterilized because you are in lieu of that child's independence. Yeah, I don't think this would do that. Um, I think that's a reading that is beyond what this is saying. It would say well, if the child the, wants the to do it. Sounds convoluted. Well, it is convoluted. That's that's absolutely true. Um, but it, it could be twisted into a number of different things. And that's and the problem. Yeah, it can be absolutely. Other questions, uh, Max. I know we're at five minutes over, so we're going to try to hurry through these. Well, real quick, I think they're trying to take these simple proposals and eventually force them to where they'll be paid for by insurance companies. Yeah, I mean, when you start talking about a fundamental right, then that's something that has to be funded if it's allowed. And, and that will be, I think, where the court cases come out of this, is that it will be, if this is passed, then it will be the uh, people going and suing the insurance companies and the state to say, you must provide the funding for this. It's my fundamental right. I have to have it. So, yeah, absolutely. Scott, real quick, and this is going to be our last one. So you got to be quick, Scott. I'll try. No, got to be quick. All right, the uh, question I've had, because I've had a couple of people out say something about this. Uh, yes or no, I'm pretty sure the state of Michigan has uh, provisions for situations like miscarriages and stuff like that for aftercare during those situations that falls under something other than abortion, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, the, yeah. Well, yeah, it absolutely is, and this would affect things like uh, uh, transgender um, surgeries and gender identification kind of stuff, hormonal therapy, everything like that. A child could decide to do that, never inform the parents, and the healthcare professional would never have to inform the parents, would never have to do anything like that. And that could go all the way up to and including surgery. So this is, listen, it is as if we have lost our collective minds. I don't know how else to describe this one. Um, if this passes, may God have mercy on us. Because that is the only way that we're going to get out of that. So, well, let's go ahead and close in prayer. I know we've got child, children's workers who probably want you to come get their kids, including mine that's running around somewhere. Uh, so, so let's pray and then we'll dismiss. If you have other questions, I'll be up here for a few minutes. Come up and ask me. I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father, we do praise you and thank you that even though we have studied all of these proposals, we've studied these elections, we are reminded that you are the one who rises, raises up kings and takes down kings. You are the one who raises up nations and takes down nations. You are the sovereign God of the universe, and we uh, trust you. We do not put our trust in princes. We do not put our trust in governments. We put our trust in the Lord and him alone. Father, we do not always understand why our culture, our society, 
our government does the things or proposes the things that they do, and we struggle with understanding that. But Father, we do trust that you are working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose, just as your word says. And if it is all things, it includes these things. But Father, we do pray that, that in our state, you know, there's a lot of things going on, but I want to pray, especially as we close tonight, I pray that this proposal fails. I pray that by an act of your mercy and grace on us, even though we are not deserving of it, and even though we have strayed far from you as a nation, as a state, as communities, Father, I pray that you would have mercy on us and protect us from this. But Father, even if it goes through, I pray that you continue to give your church and your people the boldness to stand firm on the truth of the gospel and to use their prophetic voices to speak the truth in love to everyone and not to be scared or, or uh, intimidated by any of this. Father, I thank you for our time of studying this, and I pray as we continue to go out from here uh, that this would be on our minds, that we would continue to pray for our nation, for our leaders, and for this election. And that we do so not because we're partisan, but because we seek the absolute best for our country and its people and that we seek your will above all. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.